What? Almost 50 minutes about building a wooden shelf? Let me explain what this is about. This video is about making this curved shelf with many little wooden segments and traditional wooden joinery. This is not a how to build tutorial, but rather a, I take you along with the build and show every little individual step, always explain why I do the stuff in the way I did, show every little problem I was confronted with, analyzing it, coming up with a solution and executed with many, many various woodworking techniques, some of which I've done many times and some of which were also new to me. That way, I hope you can get more out of this video for yourself in comparison to just following a building instruction, because I think the ability to analyze and solve problems on your own is more important and will in the long run bring you more skill and experience in woodworking. So now let's go back in time a few weeks and I will see you in the past. Welcome to the past in a still clean workshop where it's time to start a new and big project. A shelf to be specific with this design here. I came up with that about a year earlier and now I have the time to build it. It will be made out of ash wood and walnut and have only wooden joinery. And as you might can imagine, it will be quite a challenge. For this project, I bought two a little over 4 meter long kiln dried ash boards from a local sawmill that were cut down into roughly 2 meter long boards for me to store. They are about 30 millimeters thick and between 25 and 40 centimeters wide. The wood has been sitting in the shop for about half a year before I had the time to start the project. I also picked up a piece of walnut and in total I paid about 100 euros for that. With my very detailed cut list, I can now mark where to cut my raw material. And also exclude defects, so here's a notch that comes out on the other side. And here's a crack, unfortunately, in the most beautiful part of the board. I've tried various methods of breaking down the big boards, like the power handsaw, the touchdown, which works way better with power tools, and then I just let the tools work on their own. I need six shelf boards in total and my raw material is a lot wider than what I need. I need exactly 25 centimeters in the end. And that's because my jointer planer can handle 25 centimeters of width. Yeah, so I took that machine into the design. I already decided which pieces will be shelf boards. I now just need to mark to get the best part out of the middle. Normally I would use my sliding table for the first straight cut and removing the bark, but a saw track is much easier to align. I did that for all pieces where I cut off more than just the bark and the ones that are longer than my sliding table. And of course they are also too long for the short saw track, so getting the longer one. For the other pieces I could use the table saw and the sliding table. I need a ripping blade though. Fortunately if I crank fast enough all the way down and all the way up the blade will change by itself. Okay and up. There you go. Always make sure your equipment behaves the way you want. When I'm just removing the bark, the sliding table of course is much faster. Then I set the fence to 5mm wider than what I need in the end and cut to rough width. I'll now let the boards sit and work later on them because I first need to make the round parts and that will take a lot longer. This leftover material I now need to make into 55 strips each being 23 millimeters wide and out of them I will then make segmented half rings out of which I will then make the round parts. This journey begins with jointing one face and one edge on each piece which is enough reference for cutting segments with my jig. Cutting the strips again requires a different blade. 
So I couldn't quite get 55 strips out of that material, only 47, plus a few spare ones that are too small, but I can still use them. But I think that's not a problem because I would have needed 55 strips of that length. And since I also have some that are much longer, almost double that length, I think I still have enough material. Next now is cutting everything here into segments for half rings. To cut the segments, I'm using my wedgie sled, a jig that's made for creating segmented rings. And I've set it up for 18 segments, which is defined by the angle in between the fences here. And for 18 segments, that's exactly 20 degrees. This setup piece just has a perfect 20 degree angle in between here. And that's how I set up the fences. I only need to cut nine segments since I only need a half ring, but I will cut 10 so that after the glue up, I can guarantee that I can still get a half ring out of that glued up blank. To achieve the correct half ring size, each segment has to be the same specific length. And therefore I calculated a stop block distance, which is 53.8 millimeters. And I carefully set up my table saw fence to that. And now I can use it as a stop block. The test ring I made with these settings looks promising. And this is how the jig works. I've basically cut little triangles out of a piece now and when assembled to a ring, the grain follows the ring as good as possible, at least on the outside. And that's what I wanted. This unfortunately means I have to keep the segments ordered and I only can cut one segment at a time on the jig, which is more work. But for segments, it's the only way to achieve the grain following the curve. I now need 55 of these in total, which is gonna take a while. What a great idea. On the good side though, when assembled, the dimension from side to side should be 31 centimeters, which it seems like I hit spot on. In production mode, I also installed a second stop block for cutting off the little triangle more easily. Oh, and I also needed to deburr every individual piece, which actually took longer than cutting them. I think I still have enough material. Uh, it's not enough material. Each of these rows represents one half ring. I need 55 and I got 48. But at least I have another leftover scrap piece of ash from a different project. I just have to mill it down now and set up the jig again. And then it's enough. So I'll be right back. By the way, does anybody need more than 500 little triangles? All right, now I got everything together. These parts all came from one piece, like in the animation. These here are mixed together out of pieces that were not long enough. And this is the additional piece I had to cut. And I've also got two spare ones. I kind of lost sense of time while making this because actually cutting and deburring all these 550 parts took about eight hours. Yeah. Why simple when you can make it complicated and time consuming? I have such great ideas. And now I have to glue everything together. But well, probably for most of you this will sound and look pretty impressive. For some segmented wood turners, they will probably laugh about that. But anyways, let's go on. A very good clamping method for gluing this are big rubber bands, but they work best when the ring is complete. Otherwise, it's just a mess. But during making a test ring, it turned out that it's enough to just put a support piece right here and then I can just clamp it normally. But I still really need that clamping board that I made for segmented rings, which is really simple. It just holds the rubber band in place. And that works pretty good. When it's in this state, I can check if the distance from here to here is correct and adjust if necessary. And then I can add more rubber bands and let it dry. A cool feature of the rubber bands is that I basically don't have to align the segments because once glue is added, it kind of acts like a lubricant and the rubber band applying very even pressure 
the segments will align by themselves automatically. I made 11 spacer pieces, which means I'll make the whole glue up in 5 steps. All ring halves are now glued up. Next step now is to make both faces perfectly flat and parallel to each other. The perfect tool for making things flat is the jointer. I had to be careful though and only take half a millimeter per pass. And because this style of jointer guard swings just a bit up and not away, my hands are always protected, even with these small pieces. Now getting the second side perfectly parallel to the first one is a bit more difficult, because I could just run it through the thickness planer, but there's a very good chance, since the grain runs parallel to the cutter head at some spots, that it will damage or destroy the piece. A very good tool would be a drum sander and I actually have one, my homemade one, but at the moment it's not really in a usable condition and also not that accurate. So instead I'm going to jig something up on the table saw. With another blade of course. I've installed a tall fence and two feather boards that keep the part pressed against the fence until the cut is finished. That worked excellent and I also got a very consistent thickness around the ring. Next now comes cutting the parts actually round and to a perfect half circle. At the moment they are still a little bit bigger than that. And that's because if they already would be exactly half a circle, I would have to glue them together exactly like this and be very careful with the alignment. And I would end up with the seam always ending up in the same spot. That doesn't add any strength to the joint. And I didn't want that look. Instead I want them to randomly overlap like this. That will add a lot of strength to each joint. And I'm still able to cut a half circle out of it since all pieces are still bigger. To achieve that round shape I'll use a flush trim bit in the router table and a template. Now let's make that template. I took a piece of plywood, doesn't matter if it has a coating or not, and cut a perfectly straight edge onto it with the table saw, and then glued another random scrap of the same material to it. And now I can make a mark exactly on that glue line, and drill a hole there, and then I have a hole on exactly this edge, which I can use for a circle jig. I'm using a circle jig for a handheld router, and I made one that has three bearings here that fit perfectly around the base plate of the router that I made. And it has a sliding pin to adjust the radius. The outer radius of the template needs to be 152.5 millimeters, and I can set it up on the jig by just measuring the distance between the pin and the cutter. If I also subtract the radius of the pin, which is one and a half millimeters, so only 151. But I think I'll also add three tenths of a millimeter as a sanding addition. And a second knob for better clamping of the pin. I set the depth so it's not cutting all the way through. Now I can make the cut. I want a ring thickness of 20 millimeters, so the inner radius is 20 millimeters less than the outer radius, which is then 132.5 millimeters. I can again set this up with the calipers, which I already set correctly. This time I'm measuring from the outside and added the radius of the pin and subtracted the sanding addition. These odd radii have a reason because they match the saw blade diameter and that will be important later. I have now also evenly spaced out 10 screw hole locations for screwing the template to the workpiece. 
template fits now nicely on my blanks where I can screw it down and then flush trim to copy that shape. And yes, I'm using 10 screws because at the moment the rings are still quite fragile in comparison to the joint and the table saw where I really took off minimum amounts. I now cut away quite a bit of material and I don't want to risk break any of them. I've now spent some time off camera assembling the rings into five groups and numbered them trying to recreate the natural wood grain where the darker part is in the middle and the lighter part on the outside and wherever is in transition I put that in the correct place and that's just how I went and now it's time for shaping. I will now always start with the middle one of each group The ends I removed on the bandsaw first. While flush trimming I could feel a lot of vibration and was glad about every screw holding the ring together. For some better dust collection at the router table I also extended my 3D printed flexible hose a little bit since I had more segments laying around. Yeah, it should be better. And the first ring is done. A very fine bird that's left I'm sanding away with some very fine sandpaper. This is 500 grit. For the other rings I trimmed away much more on the bandsaw which made the work at the router a lot simpler. I got a much more consistent cut and less vibrations since the amount of material that got removed was less and also more consistent. Now that I've done that for all five middle rings I don't need a template anymore because now the middle rings are my template. I deburred all the screw holes and now I take a second ring, place that randomly on there and glue it in place. I actually want to glue a ring on top and bottom before the next rotting, but I can't do it at the same time because then I have to deal with all the slipping of the rings and also the glue tips must not contact the template. So yeah, I will now just do the first ring for all the other rings, then come back to this one, and so on. That moment when you don't run out of clamps. Out of the clamps I will next cut away most of the material on the bandsaw again, and to do that easier I set up a little guide that also follows the template, but keeps the blade away a few millimeters and that leaves a good amount for routing afterwards and I don't have to care about cutting too much away. With two more rings glued on everything is much stiffer and there's literally no more chance of breaking the rings. I could also feel that in the form of almost no more vibrations. Now it starts to take shape and from here on it's the same as before, adding more layers and flush trim them until it's finished. I ran into a problem which I hoped I wouldn't because after the third layer now some of the faces here are not quite flat anymore and I have to trim cut that on the table saw to solve that. The setup here is similar to the one before. With the last ring screwed on it was too tall for my bandsaw and you can see how much harder it got at the router. Well that was another couple days worth of work but now it's done, came out pretty good. Next is now preparing for the joinery. One problem because of the multiple layer flush trimming is that this edge here is not sharp anymore. I don't know how well you can see it on camera but it needs to be sharp again. And the other thing which is much more important is these two faces here need to be perfectly parallel to each other. And as you can see at the moment, they are not. Fortunately, I can fix both issues at once. I double sided taped some 80 grit sandpaper to my table saw and started sanding. The end of the sliding table I keep pressed down which should then only sand the high spot on the other end. That will take a while, but it works. Once flat I could sand both sides at the same time. And basically what I'm doing here is transferring the parallelism from the table saw to my workpiece. I also made pencil marks to keep track of my progress. 
After I've spent about 60 minutes with the first piece and wore out the sandpaper, I thought about various different ways of flattening that, but I couldn't really think of anything that would be faster or easier. So eventually I cut up a high quality 40 grit sanding belt and tried that, and it was like a different world. I then spent another 60 minutes sanding the remaining 4 pieces together. The surface was more than good enough and the sandpaper is still sharp. So yeah, use good sandpaper. With the joint faces now cleaned up, I next set up to cut to the same width on the table saw. And the plan was to cut to 25 centimeters wide, but as it turns out, that's not quite possible anymore. So I just changed the plan. With this now, the round parts are fully prepared for joinery. Next is preparing the boards and they are still in a rough state. So first order of business there is jointing and planing. This now requires the full capacity of my jointer planer. The edges I jointed with the sliding table because there it's easier to handle the big pieces. Next then cutting to final width and length. The boards are now also prepared, but I have a problem. As I mentioned earlier, this board with the beautiful grain pattern has the crack and I decided to keep the crack and fill it with resin and cut off the other side. This is some walnut sanding dust. Three minutes of mixing looks a bit funny at high speed. This crack fortunately is closed on the bottom, so there shouldn't be any leak outs and this is a very easy pour. The last leftover gets removed when I'm sanding everything. I'll use a tongue and groove joint between the boards and the roundings. To cut the grooves into the roundings, I've elongated my router table a little bit, added a long fence and two stop blocks, and that should provide good guidance during cutting. The 8mm bit I'm using can plunge, which makes this a lot simpler. The cut depth I'm aiming for is 15 millimeters and I make that in two passes. That worked great. And by the way, these roundings will only take half the load of the weight, but in this glued up state, they are not fragile anymore. From the flush room tolerances during making the round parts, each slot is now just very slightly differently positioned in the thickness of the piece. So to compensate that with the boards, I already laid out the whole shelf and decided what piece goes where and numbered everything and next now I will cut each tongue matching its specific groove. That will be a lot more setup work but then I won't have alignment issues afterwards. I'm using this pretty simple router jig, which I also have a video about on my channel. And I've set this fence so the tongues are one millimeter less deep than the grooves. So there's room for glue. And the height of the bit, which will determine the thickness of the tongue, I will set every time individually. I'll try to align the boards with the inner part of the curve, because on the outside it's much easier to correct any mistakes by sanding. And now I try to find the thinnest part. 6.1, 6.3. 6.3, so 6.1. The jig is guided by the fence, which rides along the edge of the board, and the first depth is set to a bit less than my target depth. After the first cut, I deburr the ends and then measure the current cut depth. 
With that as reference, I sneak up to the final depth with the micro adjustment of the router. That way it was quite simple and fast to achieve a cutting depth that's different for every piece. For the other side I reset the starting depth on the router and did the same thing with the only difference that I'm sneaking up on the correct thickness. Altogether, this then only took about one and a half hours for all parts. The shoulders I roughly cut off on the bandsaw. And the rest I did by hand with my very improvised bench vise. Thanks to the careful setup work before, the first test fit was a winner. Just for fun I assembled one segment here dry and without any support on this end and I only get this amount of sag which is not very much so this is pretty good considering how this is joined together. Of course this doesn't support any weight and will start to crack if I push on there but with the support here this will be perfectly strong. So yeah, it works. I brought all the parts upstairs to have a first look at the whole thing assembled. And up to this point, the whole project was more or less simple. And now it gets quite a bit more difficult and complicated. Because next I need to add the supports and I need to make them fit the sanded surface of all pieces. And to sand everything, I should glue it together because then I can sand everything nice and flush to each other but I can't glue it together without the supports because then the whole shelf won't be able to support its own weight. Yeah, quite a problem. And additionally, I need to cut the joinery for the supports before assembling or gluing anything together. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna start with now. The joint will be kind of a mortise and tenon and I marked on each rounding where the mortise will be, a little off center, that's just part of the design. The perfect tool to cut this is the panther router. I made a template for two different sizes of mortises because I will use a floating tenon. The inner part is for a tight fit that will be for the support pieces and the outer part is for a loose fit in one direction that's for the shelf parts. It will make more sense in a little bit. The mortises should start 57 and a half millimeters from this edge so right about here and to set that up I cut a scrap piece to exactly that width. Now I'm touching this part of the template with the follower so the router bit won't move any further than that. And I can bring it forward and then touch the router bit with this piece, hold it down for a moment and align a stop block there. The starting height is 25 and a half millimeters which is this setup block here. I can now just lower the bit down onto that until it touches and then lock down the template holder. So now I have two stops in the front and this one to align my piece. And here with the help of a couple of blocks I can clamp it down. The depth stop I have set when the bit touches at the lowest position that it then cuts about 12 millimeters deep. By now following the template the router copies the template to my workpiece at half scale in the form of the mortise. Since the mortises are off center, half of them are on the other side. So I set up on the other side on the pantry router, the rest is the same. For the mortises in the top and bottom board, I tilted the table vertical. And I had to rotate the template 90 degrees because the boards are also mounted 90 degrees in comparison to the round parts. 
I've just checked the dimensions and discovered a terrible mistake I've made because from the CAD model I got distance from the start of the mortise to the outer edge and what I drew into my piece was from this edge. That now means the mortise is off in this direction by the size of the tongue. Fortunately there's a relatively simple solution. I just need to cut off the tongue and then recut it. This will then bring the mortise to the right location. I will lose a little bit of length on the board but that's acceptable. Last step before gluing is to round over the corners of the top and bottom board. Therefore I just quickly threw together a corner radius jig out of scrap pieces. I also already rounded the parts which I thought I can't reach later anymore. The glue up now isn't really straightforward because there's no way I can clamp this properly. A long clamp wouldn't work and there's just nothing to attach the clamp to. So I made some special clamping blocks that are clamped to the rounding and have a flat surface here that is in line with the joint. And that now allows me to put a clamp above and below the joint and clamp it properly. Here it's the same but much simpler. And on the other end there's a dummy support. Dry assembly looks good, the joint is closed and this clamp here is to align the edges. I think I'm ready for the glue. What a great camera angle. That worked pretty good actually. Now I let this dry for about half an hour and then I can go on with the next one. Looks like this first joint didn't fully close, but it's not really a problem because it's the first one I've done and this is the underside. Nobody will ever see that. You can also see that when I bring up a square, it's touching on the top, but on the bottom it's not in line with the glue joint and that should be. But I think that's not such a big problem. I can force it in place. We'll see. On the second rounding, I now check the alignment with the square. So it's touching on the top and it's flush on the bottom. I can also adjust that alignment by varying the clamping pressure on the four clamps. So yeah, this should now come out better. A couple of things I've already learned from the few glue ups. The side to side alignment requires a little bit more force than this clamp can provide. So this is now a job of my biggest clamp I have in terms of clamping strength. The clamping brackets and blocks were slipping a few times. So I added a second clamp there and also put some sandpaper in between here and that worked. I still can't really tighten these down all the way but that's okay, that's not really necessary. And then I've also added a glue drip catcher. Checking the alignment here, it looks pretty good and the supports in the end can also fix that last little bit. A couple joints also needed some more fitting before gluing. After the glue dried overnight, I started preparing for sanding, which means lots of doodling and I also prepared my haircut for sanding. I then started with 40 grit, but only sanded the roundings and the transitions with that grit. In another video I made a special handheld sander which was specifically made for sanding the inner roundings of this project. It has a foam backing, uses hook and loop sandpaper and is powered by a drill. And it did an amazing job here. I then spent a full day with sanding everything. I've now sanded everything to 180 grit and next I'm going to round over the corners. Therefore I've installed a roundover bit in the router and screwed a longer board to the base. And that way I have more support for the router and don't have to balance it on the edge. 
It also turned out that I still had access to all spots for a round over. Now it's already looking and feeling pretty good. Next now is adding in the supports so it's finally able to support its own and then also some more weight. Because at the moment it is not really stiff or strong. The individual parts in themselves are really strong, but it's just the leverage of the long pieces that make it behave that flimsy. The supports will be made out of this piece of walnut and as you can see the really dark part of it isn't really much but definitely not for what I need so I'll do my best getting most of that out of there. You guessed it, a different plate. Then again jointing and cutting to final dimensions. I puzzled everything together again to one piece and I think on the shelf it looks best if I use these two on one side and these three on the other side. Next step now is to cut a matching round shape onto the supports so they properly can sit on the roundings. My initial idea of doing that was using my big saw blades and just slowly moving the ends of the pieces across the blade, slowly creating that curve. And that's why I made the diameter of the roundings the same diameter as my big saw blades. But somewhere I screwed up because the roundings now have 305 millimeter in diameter and the saw blades 315. So that method doesn't work anymore. The diamond saw blade I have is closer to that diameter but not quite the same. So I have to use a different method. So instead, with the help of my CAD model and the CNC router, I made this template for the router where I can clamp my stock onto and then with the flush trim bit copy that correct round shape onto the ends. With that, I made a test piece and the curve fits pretty good. I just screwed up the length a bit. A sacrificial piece prevents blowout on the end. The flush trim bit is not tall enough but I could set it so I can make the first cut with the jig and finish the cut without the jig without changing the bit height. With one side cut I next figure out the length for each support individually. I need to measure the distance between here and I just do that with some scrap pieces. Then I can bring this to the other side and fix in place there. And I just trim the end of the support here until it's a perfect fit. Ah, not quite there yet. And now after the fifth trim cut, I'm there. And that's not also the reason why I sanded everything before fitting the supports because otherwise the very slight thickness change from sanding may would have ruined a great fit. Except for the last 240 grit pass I'll make, there I think the thickness change is insignificant. For all other supports it's now basically the same except for the ones that connect two round parts. There I sneak up on the fit with the router template instead of the table saw. And now, with all of them done, I can cut their joinery. To cut the joinery, I again set up on the panther router, this time using the inner part of the template that I used before. And now I will cut a centered mortise into all support pieces. Quite important, to cut the mortise on the other side, I rotate the piece, but with the same side on the table. Doing that ensures that this side thickness is the same on both mortises and that's important because later that will align the whole shelf. Next I grabbed some random scrap pieces of hardwood and made them into floating tenons. Blowing this fully in will require some brute force so I brought some and I want to try to minimize the glue squeeze out. 
Once fully pressed in, this also doesn't require any further clamping. The maximum mortise depth in the round pieces is a little over 12 millimeters. So now I've set up a stop lock to trim the tenons to a little bit less than that. Now I can test fit every individual one. Here I need to trim the tenon a little shorter. All right, all supports fit and the shelf is able to stand alone without any other temporary supports. It unfortunately does the thing I hoped it wouldn't. It leans back a little bit. As you can see, there's now always a little gap in the front part of the joint because the whole shelf is leaning back. But once I glue and clamp it together, I hope this will then straighten out the shelf again. And when the glue is dry, it will hold the shelf straight. Last step before gluing is to finish up the supports, which I did with the belt sander, then adding a round over and finish sand with a pneumatic sander and by hand. For gluing in the supports now, I also finish sanded the outer roundings and then I've installed a pendulum at the ceiling to get a straight reference. And I will now start with the bottom support because that has the biggest impact on how straight the whole shelf will be. I can also reuse this part for clamping that I used before. And then when it's glued in place, I can compare how straight the shelf is in comparison to the pendulum and then counteract with a clamp from one side or the other. I've just made a dry assembly and clamped it and it looks pretty good. There's a two millimeter gap everywhere between the pendulum and the shelf boards. So I think this works. Okay, it's glued in. I have one additional clamp and tighten it just a very tiny bit to bring the top over by a few millimeters. Now I let this dry for about an hour and then can do the next one. It's out of the clamp, nothing moved, it's still straight so I think I can go on. Second support is glued and clamped in place. These cross pieces I clamped on there keep these clamping brackets from sliding away because of the clamp. And the last piece is clamped. All right, now it's fully glued up and able to stand on its own without any other temporary supports. Unfortunately, it didn't came out perfectly straight. It now leans back by about a centimeter, but I can live with that. I had the choice between it being perfectly straight, but then having small gaps in between some joints or vice versa. And I definitely wanted the joints to be closed. So yeah, that's how it is now. It's perfectly fine. If it sits on an uneven floor, I would have to level it out anyways. Also, it still does shake a little bit, but any shelf with that small footprint being this tall would do that. So I don't see a problem there. But the shelf in itself is now much more stiff and rigid. There's no more wobbling and yeah, I can actually lift it up and nothing moves, nothing cracks. It's definitely not stiff enough for any purpose, but for it being a living room shelf, therefore it's more than stiff enough and perfectly adequate. Everything left to do now is to give it a finish sanding, which is basically the same as before, except for the inner roundings. I unfortunately don't have hook and loop sandpaper with 240 grit, so there I'm using my little pneumatic sander. And after that, then it's ready for finish. I've used this hard oil finish before and I really like it. It leaves a very nice finish and it's extremely simple to apply. Just put on a layer and let the wood soak up the amount it wants. All right, first coat on the first side is on. I'll now let this oil sit for 20 minutes and then wipe off the excess. For the roundings, I really don't know what's the best method. I just did half of the rounding inside and outside. And now once wiped off, I will flip it over and immediately do the other side and then do the rest of the roundings. You won't see the drips in the end. So yeah, there are also already some beautiful spots showing, for example, this one where I filled the crack with resin, but that's actually the underside because on the other side, the wood looks even better. <laughs> 
The next day I sanded everything again with a sanding sponge, vacuumed and wiped off the dust with a tack cloth and applied a second coat. The only disadvantage with the oil is that I should wait about a week before I really can use the shelf, but the result is worth the time. Well, the shelf is now done and turned out great and I'm very happy with it. I think this looks amazing. Probably not everybody's style, but I think it's something that you don't see every day. The really last thing missing are some feet and there I'll just use some self-adhesive felt pads where it will sit on and that's it. Because the room that this will go into also isn't very tall at that spot so I need very thin feet and felt pads are perfect for that. And that's it with this project and the video. I really hope you could get something out of that. Some ideas, some techniques, some entertainment or whatever. I also plan on making a dedicated Q&A video about this project. So if you have any questions just leave them in the comments with a little note like hashtag Q&A so I can find it easily and I'll try my best in answering all of them. A few more facts. The whole project from start to finish took about four weeks. The video was made from more than 600 individual clips, a total of more than 200 gigabytes of raw footage. It took me forever to edit it, so I really hope you liked it and got something out of it. Now, if you want to support this and the stuff I do, there are two good possibilities. One is Patreon where you can support me with a couple bucks or whatever you want per month and stop it at any time. And the other one is my Amazon wishlist where you can gift me with various things I put on there. Totally not necessary because I upload my videos to YouTube for everybody to enjoy. And the best support actually is if just everybody watches all my videos. But if you want to do more, there are the possibilities and they are always linked in every video description of my videos. So check it out if you want. And now this thing needs to go to its final location. The aging segments are defined by this angle in between here, which I get from this template. This here is just a perfect 20 degree angle. For 18 segments, that's 20 degrees, and this setup and this setup piece just has a twin perfect 20 degree angle in between here. Next, I have to glue to glue all of that together. <laughs> yeah. Now gluing all of that together, only on complete rings.